Okay, welcome again to our second part of lecture one, um, the study of social behaviors. And in this case, we are going to go over an example from the performing arts uh, to dancers, uh, interactions, and uh, how to analyze that data. Uh, just a reminder of the class objectives that uh, we here are going to learn about natural behaviors from a biorhythmic perspe perspective. Uh, we are going to learn about levels of behavioral description and their applications. And we are going to translate existing methods in brain science to behavioral science and learn about biosensors in general. So it's a continuation of our first lecture. Um, this is a case of digitizing ballet and as an example of the use in uh, active marker face uh, camera, the face face systems in uh, the performing arts. Here's our former student, Dr. Vilmini Canapasidou, who uh, kindly supplied uh, these pictures uh, to illustrate some of the poses uh, from uh, very well trained uh, uh, ballet, uh, acting as a soloist and in a dyad, uh, in a duet, and in a group. Um, and so partner dancing it can be studied once again as a complex dynamical system and what we are trying to do is create a new language to represent and to think that synthesize uh, ballet routines. This is an example of data acquisition and calibration uh, using a grid of cameras that uh, sample at 960 hertz. We mentioned these cameras in last lecture. Uh, this is the face space and uh, we can create our own avatar and represent the positions and the orientations of the various parts of the limbs and the trunk and, and the head. And this is uh, because we have a grid of uh, 78 sensors across the two dancers. Uh, here's an example of how three-dimensional data is acquired, uh, position and orientation data. So we have to diversion data of uh, the motions and we can then trace the, the trajectories of those motions, of those complex motions for both the male and the female. So here's an example of a, of a snapshot of the routine um, and the trajectory of the 39 uh, sensors in each one of them in, represented in blue trajectories for the male and in red for the female. And we can uh, place a moving frame that uh, enables us to study the curvature and the torsion of this curve and other features like the speed of the curve and the acceleration of the curve. And we can then uh, extract automatically segments across these uh, that are marked here by these uh, black dots corresponding to the pulses in the speed of the motion. Uh, and although there are, these are very complex motions, we can certainly characterize their, their various kinematic parameters and geometric uh, features. Uh, one of these uh, peaks and valleys uh, uh, curves that we can create, for example, in our time series, for example, of the speed or of the bending or curvature of the curve of the, of the trajectory, uh, we can then scale them uh, so this is, for example, in meters uh, per second, and this is bending in centimeters. Um, so these are different physical units, uh, but we can standardize them and account for effects of allometry, of 
different anatomical differences which have an impact on the motion because clearly a taller person uh, has a broader range of uh, the speed or bending than a small little baby. And if you want to study, use the same methodology to study the population uniformly, then you need to come up with a standardized data type. So we created a data type called the Micro Movement Spikes, MMS, and we uh, scaled those uh, fluctuations in the amplitude of the signal or also in the inter-peak interval timings. But in this case, the amplitude of the signal was then normalized by dividing each peak, each max, local maxima, uh, by the sum of that value and the average between mean to mean. So um, between these two uh, minima, any, any two minima there, there are many points because this, the cameras are sampling at 960 hertz. Uh, so you take that average value and this then scales everything between zero and one. Uh, but before doing that, we, we had to take the raw peaks and empirically estimate the, the distribution, the probability distribution characterizing this as a, as a, as a random process and then uh, rescale everything between zero and one. Uh, once you take these micro movement spikes, you can plot the peaks in a frequency histogram. And what we have found is that in all these parameters of biorhythmic activity um, span skew distributions, that they're not symmetric, even though that's the, that's the underlying assumption that we see people make in the field. Um, so once you have that uh, frequency histogram, you can um, empirically estimate, for example, using maximum likelihood estimation, the probability density function and uh, the probability distribution function. And in this case, for example, uh, we did so with all these data points that we generated from all the routines and the, and the uh, through over the passage of time. And uh, characterize them in a parameter space uh, using the continuous gamma family of probability distributions and representing the shape and the scale, the dispersion of each uh, point, which, which correspond to each distribution here, uh, which in turn corresponds to each one of the uh, time series of, of the markers of the male and the female. And so we can characterize them uh, and what we have learned empirically through empirical characterization is that this parameter space has meaning in terms of pathologies of the nervous system, neurodevelopment, adaptive processes of motor control, and so forth. And it goes like this. You have um, scatter points. You can uh, log log uh, the, the parameter space and plot that scatter points. And under the micro movement spikes parameterization, of the fluctuations away from the mean, from the empirical estimated mean, uh, this is uh, spanning a power law that uh, covers several of these decades here. Um, and uh, what we have found is that if you were to median rank this scatter and uh, break down this, this parameter plane into different quadrants, and you have the right lower quadrant and the, and the left upper quadrant, uh, of this scatter distributed along the line of unity, this blue region here is uh, where you want to be. This is where the distributions are uh, symmetric, uh, where there is good predictability in the signal, where there's low uh, noise to signal ratio here along the scale, which uh, the gamma scale parameter, which is also the noise to signal ratio. And so, um, what we have found is that over over here in the exponential case, when the when the shape parameter equals one, uh, we have the case of autism uh, with very high noise as well. So in the, in the left upper quadrant, we can we have localized the signatures of the autistic phenotype uh, and other other phenotypes uh, as well, like Parkinson's and a stroke and so on. So it's a pathology state here. 
Um, whereas over here we have good neurodevelopment, um, even in babies, they will fluctuate across these quadrants, but will have a tendency, the trend is to land eventually in this quadrant here. Um, this has a correspondence with the moments, uh, parameter space of the gamma moments, and these are so many statistics that we empirically estimate as well. And so we have um, for this particular uh, data set, this is where the lower speed uh, lies. This is the, the noise to signal ratio uh, over here. Um, so the mean, the variance, the skewedness, uh, the size of the mark is proportional to the kurtosis. And we can characterize here and localize the, the right uh, left quadrant where you have the, the low noise to signal ratio and the high predictability in this region. Uh, and likewise, we can see the scattering red here uh, and we can characterize the points that, um, that are different, that, that are fundamentally different from the blue. Uh, we can also study uh, using similarity metrics uh, the differences across the space of one point and its neighboring points. And remember, these are, this is a probability distribution space. And so we use to that end uh, the canter was was sustained distance or the air move resistance that we uh, mentioned in the last class. Uh, and we then can characterize the differentiation between exponential and Gaussian distributions um, in a theoretical sense, and also in an empirical sense, we can see uh, where these distributions lie in what part of the, of the parameter space. We can then also take the micro movement spikes, for example, of the bending parameter here in this case, and uh, which are in the time domain, and then do frequency domain analysis, power analysis, power spectrum analysis, and pairwise analysis of cross coherence and cross spectrum phase. Um, and we can study the ranges uh, of uh, the frequency ranges uh, of this data, which remember is self generated by, by the nervous system. Uh, these motions are uh, estimated from the markers, but are nonetheless motions that are self generated by each one of the dancers and by the together, the shared space that they that they, uh, or they cohesively share um, these signals. So one interesting thing that we noted here is that in the, in the range, is a range of frequencies that has been characterized in engineering fields, uh, such as uh, in structural engineering, where in the low range, uh, you have, for example, tall buildings and large ships and long suspension bridges that the nervous system is sensitive to those vibrations in that range. In the range from three to 30, you have vehicles and nearby machinery and building components and, the, and so on and, and uh, seismic activity, trains. So these are the kinds of things that we sense. Uh, and then in the, in the higher, uh, frequencies so between 30 and 100, we have uh, vibrations in the small building panels like the windows and floor shaking and uh, light shaking uh, of windows and room fitting and so on and so on. So these are all audible noise. These are uh, noise that we detect. Uh, beyond that, um, we know that mechanical oscillations up to 100 kilohertz are uh, our, our study and are under examination in this field, but we don't know if the nervous system, the human nervous system is sensitive to those. So but this is an interesting, um, interesting distribution that we would like to characterize using the, these methods. So like in the last lecture I was mentioning with the dyadic interaction in the clinical test, here we also can parameterize the biorhythmic activity across this uh, grid of sensors of, of uh, 78 sensors. So we have the 39 sensors of the female 
the 39 sensors of the male across all the body. And this can be conceived as body nodes. Um, and we can then look at the, at the max co uh, cross coherence matrix. So if you have an entry in this, in this matrix, for example, this entry here about uh, 0.5, that has a corresponding phase lag. Um, in this case, the positive phase lag uh, is plotted here and a corresponding frequency. And so you can establish then uh, a visualization tool where you can uh, visualize the male network, the female network, and the shared network here in, in, in black um, traces. Uh, the colors here represent different modules, different subnetworks that you can interpret as synergies that self-emerge. And this is, for example, happening in the frequency band between 31 and 40 hertz, uh, but we can decompose different frequency bands uh, and uh, visualize the, net, the dynamic network or the activity of the network as time unfolds across different frequency bands. So here is the, the band between zero and 10, and that's very different representation than the, say the higher level bands that we don't, we've never characterized in the human physiology case. So um, these are different representations that we can explore uh, using these, these uh, methods. And in the context of information transmission and mutual information and so forth, we can then uh, study these across different frequency bands for the body of the male, for the body of the female, but more interestingly, in the case of interactions for the shared cohesiveness that they have. Here's an example where you can take the modularity uh, metric, which is one of the connectivity metrics of the network analysis, and take the bending and the speed uh, signals that, that we derive from the trajectories of those 78 uh, nodes, and, and track separately the female and the male to see the participation of each of the nodes in the modules that self-emerge as synergistic uh, activity of subnetworks that self-emerge within the network. That is uh, groups of nodes that are heavily interconnected among themselves, but uh, sparsely connected with other nodes. And so, for example, in the in the first five, let's focus on the first five modules of this network. You can measure the participation of each node. So, take um, node number ten here uh, for modules four and five. Uh, uh, three and four here, and you can see the changes in the node participation. Uh, one is seven times, or six times, and so forth. Uh, or, mo or module 15, and you can see that the, there is lower participation of the, of the nodes. It's, um, it's ordered by, by participation here. And you can take this information, and for each module, you can say, for example, uh, take the maximum number of, uh, of node participation they have and take uh, half of that and, and threshold everything above that that is shared between the male and the female for each one of the modules uh, and the nodes that participate in each module. So you can determine those that are common to all of them in the different body parts. Right? So in the avatar that we construct, we have different body segments that uh, involve different nodes, so the head, the neck, and, and so on, shoulders. So that, that would be a region that we track and see if these nodes are shared both by the male and the female synchronously uh, over time. And so, for example, here for one routine, we create this representation where um, Let's just go to this one that is simpler, for example. There are two uh, nodes that participate twice in the female and in the male together, and those are the, the lumbar region of the female, uh, I'm sorry, the, the left leg region of the female and the, and, the, and the right leg region of the female, and the lumbar region of the male, the lumbar region of the male in the left side of the body, the lumbar region in the right side of the body, 
and also the left arm of the male. So we plot them here in yellow, the left arm, the left and right lumbar region, and the left and right legs of the female, and that's synchronized in that particular module, uh, which comprises a number of, uh, of frames as well. Um, in this other module one, you have more participation of the nodes, and so you have the, the thorax uh, of the female uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the thorax of the male um, synchronous with the, with the thorax of the female and the lumbar and the, the left and right legs. And so we can plot those uh, as well. And then uh, run a movie that tells us um, make it a little bit better here. So we can uh, look at the different modules as they uh, change color, uh, signaling their synchronous, their synchronous activity. So the yellow um, in both bodies are synchronous uh, for each one of the modules and uh, create this language of uh, matrix representation, uh, seven by seven uh, body segments that can tell us about the different uh, synchrony of the body parts. Um, so that can provide um, information about different different body parts and so forth. So, um, so we can then um, examine the, those different representations and bring them all together and overlay the the two um, overlay the two uh, movies the movie that is the actual movie of the performance and the movie that we create with our computational techniques and we can overlay them and see uh, side by side what happens in real time when, when the dancers finish the routine. We can also study different levels of noise and build visualization tools that tell different from lower to higher noise to signal ratio during the non-dancing part of the routine when they're calibrating or planning what they're going to do next and so forth. Uh, versus when they are actually dancing and, and their PDFs are actively changing. So at that point, uh, we realized that these methods can really capture cohesiveness uh, in a network sense. And we had a postdoc, Dr. Madeline Williams in uh, from molecular neuroscience program in our lab. And she brought some cells, some uh, induced performance stem cells, uh, neuro precursor cells from the labs of Man, Shiko Bloom, and Jim Milenik at the RBHS. Um, these were from families uh, from a large cohort uh, of New Jersey families that have first degree relatives with a special uh, language impairment. And they took blood and uh, created uh, induced proposed stem cells uh, to generate clone them and generate uh, neon precursor cells. So, so they can study how these cells uh, convert to neurons, transition into neurons. They, prolifer they, can, they can study the proliferation of the cells and one of the, and, and compare the siblings and they affected, the unaffected sibling and the autistic child and so on. And one of the things that, um, uh, Dr. William told me when I visited their lab is the manual count of the cells. So they sit there under the microscope and basically uh, with a clicker can count the number of cells and uh, based on concentric circles and uh, the area in those circles as they grow the circles uh, towards the edges, they can say which ones are uh, proliferating and which one. So I'm not, but one of the things that I noticed, I noticed two things. One is that they enforce the Gaussian distribution, uh, and we can see this here uh, in the symmetric error bars that they impose in these 
in these plots, which are heavy tails, and these are these are no gauss and these are heavy uh, skew distributions. So, so there is a, a data loss there by imposing uh, a mean, a Gaussian mean. But the other thing was that I noticed they there was some micro motion there that we could perhaps explore, and I asked them to uh, put a camera, and they did. So. It's just a reminder that we, we should always do the range test to, to make sure that we're within the ranges of the, of the data. And so she put a, uh, Dr. Williams put a camera and uh, used a cell tracker software uh, to capture motion of uh, half a hertz. But within uh, 300 frames, we could see already uh, that there was, there was motion and, and these, this cell was uh, actually moving. Uh, not all the cells, of course, moved in the same uh, at the same rate. So these cells moved a lot. That's the same cell tracking uh, a trajectory, tracing a trajectory, and these cells didn't move that much. This particular cell didn't move, move that much, and so on. And so we can um, each pixel here uh, corresponds to 0.65 micrometers, and we can track. 46 cells in, in total in the Petri dish, and we can look at the distance traveled from the origin in pixels across 600 seconds in this case, for example. Um, we can do other, we have other other cells that, that other Petri dishes that travel, that were tracked for longer as well. And, and this gives us a sense that traveling that kind of distance per unit time, you can estimate the speed, the individual speed. And so you can uh, look at pairwise interactions across the Petri dish um, and how the motions of one may affect the neighbor, the neighboring cells. And we do our, our we take our time series and convert them to micro movements, do the power spectrum analysis, the co cross coherence and cross spectrum phase estimates. So, take our maximum, determine the frequency, then go to that and determine the phase at which they're shifted. And we build our parameterization here once again. And we study the distributions and on the Petri dish physically in the physical space, we can, this, we can look at the four quadrants and look at the interactions between the cells, vertical interactions, horizontal interactions, and represent the cells, for example, the amount of motion in the size of the cell or the modules that self-emerge and other information. This is another re network representation that we can use in a circular map. Uh, and then we can uh, essentially compare uh, the cross coherence. This is from the autistic this is the movie of the cross coherence matrix and, and so how, how they evolve over time. And here we can compare the two side by side and see that the, uh, the, the samples from the autistic individual did not move a lot and did not have as many connections as the other control sample. Um, so these are for 180 minutes and we can do the same for the autistic individual and see how different they they are actually. And again, this is also a very sparse connectivity representation here for the autistic individual as, as time goes by in, in relation to the control. This is a control sibling, an affected sibling. Okay, so this gives us a sense that everything pretty much is motion if we look at it as vibrations. The biorhythms entrain and the entrainment is objectively quantifiable. And this quantification can be done from neurons to complex social behaviors and also to complex routines in the performing arts. Uh, please revisit the lecture objectives and uh, we can then go over all these methods in class. Um,